Ishmael is important, of course, because he is with his father, the founder of the South Semitic Sanctuary at Mecca. And this is, in truncated form, the broad story of human religious history, <coughs> at least for the Abrahamic family. Isaac, of course, the founder of um, the familiar Judeo-Christian line of prophets, Solomon, David, and others, I haven't written in there, which ends, or in the Christian view, culminates with Jesus. And traditionally, um, the Judeo-Christian tradition has uh, regarded Ishmael as a kind of dead end. He's the wild man, the outcast, who lives in the desert, he's rejected, the covenant doesn't extend to him. Um, so even a, a traditional um, Hebrew term for the really hopeless outcast Gentiles is Yishmaelim, the Ishmaelites, continues to this day. Uh, to the extent that I recently discovered this, when uh, uh, Jews made their translations of, of the Talmud into Russian in the 19th century, and uh, commentary literature that was sometimes very critical of Christianity, so as not to get into trouble with the police, they actually substituted all the references to Christians, uh, to references to the Yishmaelim, this being a kind of code word for the outcast. But in the Islamic pers perspective, of course, does, God doesn't work like that. Israel is the one who struggled with God. Ismail is the one who listened to God. That's what the words mean. And God is necessarily with the outcast, with the downtrodden, with the despised, with the one who's sent out to fend for himself. Um, this, of course, ties into a lot of modern Muslim third worldism, liberationism. The West is the privileged, smug, bloated tradition of the privileged. And Ishmael is paradigmatically the founder of third world righteousness. Very important theme. Now, Muhammad is the only prophetic descendant of, of Ismail. Now, the reason why Muhammad is regarded as being final and definitive, even though Jesus has the messianic role, is that Muhammad closes a universal cycle, or at least one that goes back to Abraham. Hence the Abrahamic resonances of the Meccan sanctuary, of the Hajj, um, the Abrahamic prayers that form part of the five, day, five times daily worship. Um, Abraham really is the, the prototype for, for Muhammad. So he closes a big story, um, whereas Jesus, in the Muslim view, closes the Jewish story, which really opens with Moses. So it's a lesser epicycle, if you like. And hence, on the traditional Muslim view, Jesus is not a universal prophet. He was sent only to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. He didn't really conceive himself to have a Gentile mission even though, of course, on the Gospel account there were centurions and others whom he preached to. But the Muslim understanding is that he was, he was Jewish, he was for the Jewish people, he was their Messiah. The point of the Messiah was that he was a Jewish figure who culminated the Jewish story. He wasn't supposed to have a universal significance. Whereas Muhammad, on this traditional view, is the seal of the prophets, which in terms of human meta-history is the definitive summation of everything that's gone before. Um, and implicitly includes this because this is also included in, in Abraham. And hence, Muslims believe that only Muhammad salam, had a universal vocation. He said, other prophets were sent only to their own people. I'm sent to all mankind. And I thought I'd say that just to clarify the relationship of the two branches of the Abrahamic family as Muslims see it. Where in the Quran is that? Is that a Quran? It's, it's a hadith. Khat, Khatam and Nabiin, seal of the prophets, is Quranic. Um, but the one about I'm sent to all mankind is from a hadith. Um, okay, let's take a couple of questions. Barbara? Yeah, is Isaac older than Ishmael or Ishmael? Is Ish Ishmael is the firstborn son. He's the elder son, yes. But he's the son of, of Hajar, or Hajar, who is the bondmaid. Oh, okay. And hence, at least in, in Jewish law, in the Jewish understanding, um, inferior to the one born of Sarah in her old age, who is Isaac. Oh. <coughs> Again, the fact that he's born of a slave feeds into certainly modern Muslim understandings of Islam as the religion of the righteous, oppressed third world. Um, and also Muslim feminists like Hajar, I didn't mention her in the list of female ideal types yesterday, uh, because 
Sarah is kind of housebound and she's a good <coughs> housewife and she's an archetypal mother uh, and not much more than that. Whereas Hajar is kind of, uh, she fends for herself. She's cast loose in, loose in the desert by Abraham. So she's a model of a more autonomous type of woman. <coughs> Sometimes in modern Muslim feminism you find her cited as an example of why Islam has allegedly a superior view of female autonomy to the Judeo-Christian tradition, which obviously is monumentally arguable, but at least she fulfills that, um, if you like, polemical point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the biblical spelling, the King James <coughs> spelling, is Hajar. Uh, yes, it does. Now, before I leave this, Hajar is also significant in terms of this claim to the Prophet's universal ambition in that Isaac is pure Hebrew, 100% of Hebrew ancestry, whereas Ishmael, ancestor of the Ishmaelites, who are the Arabs, is half Egyptian. <coughs> so half Egyptian, because Hajar is an Egyptian bondmaid. So not only does the Ishmaelite line signify God's preferential option for the outcast, but it also signifies the fact that the Ishmaelite line is the one that is destined for the whole world because it's half Gentile already. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to say something else. Um, when yesterday, when we ended, I do want to take a, you can take a look at different versions or the way that each, each religion connects on the Day of Judgment. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, the Jewish way of looking at the end of time, mm -hmm. the Christian, of course, revelation in English there is the end of time, mm -hmm. and then uh, and the, the uh, Islamic version mm -hmm. of the Day of Judgment, mm -hmm. and how they connect or don't connect. Judaism has always been fairly agnostic about the last things. Um, possibly through Christian, sometimes Islamic influence. It did in the, Middle East, uh, the medieval period evolve a vision of the Day of Judgment, um, but it's never terribly important for traditional Judaism, which is often, although theocentric, quite this worldly about the people, about the law, about good living in, in this world and leaving the next world to the imagination of, of God, if you like. Um, the uh, Christian tradition is much clearer, but very diverse, and probably you know better than I do exactly how things are expected to pan out. Although in modern theology I've noticed eschatology has dwindled almost to a vanishing point. Um, the, at least the professors of theology in England never write books about it. The judgment, heaven and hell, it's, it's uh, something they will affirm privately, but they don't somehow knit it into their public teaching. Um, although, of course, the mainline churches are still formally committed to an idea of resurrection, heaven and hell. Uh, and sometimes this thing called the harrowing of hell, which is comparable to the Muslim idea of the intercession whereby Christ <coughs> descends into hell to intercede for sinners. And the Islamic um, perception is that it's a kind of multi-faith event, partly because of Islam's assurance that all the prophets have been just as good at saving people, and that continues on the Day of Judgment. They will all intercede, not just the prophets, but according to a hadith, righteous people from their communities, so saints can intercede as well. And the hadith, uh, there are some quite long hadith which illustrate the day of judgment and the scene of terror and everybody naked, running around, looking for people to help them. And each of the prophets will be standing on a prominent place carrying uh, a flag of a particular color that's associated with his message and his community. And people will go to their prophet to uh, receive intercession. Uh, and the distinguishing feature of Muhammad, again because of his role as seal is that he doesn't just intercede for his own people but he intercedes for sinners of other communities as well.